All right, so we're back here with our awesome nonlinear process of science visual. And we're going to now focus in on this idea of testing ideas. We're testing observations, we're testing concepts, we're testing hypotheses. If you roll over the testing ideas circle, you'll see that it does begin with a hypothesis. That a hypothesis, and I say it begins with a hypothesis, you are seeing um, observations, you're, you're seeing things around you, and you develop this, this idea that then relates to collecting data. We've talked about the hypothesis a lot. The thing that I want to talk further about in this section is a little bit more of the nitty gritty on designing the experiment. So how do we actually test that hypothesis? I wonder if you can hear my neighbor um, mowing their lawn right there. I, I bet you can't hear it. We'll know there's a weed eater happening out there that, can you hear that? I'm going to try really hard to ignore it. Okay. Part of, we've identified a hypothesis, and part of the, th the next thing to do is to set up an experiment. And when we do an experiment, we need to identify the variables that we'll be dealing with in that experiment. I'm gonna write them all down first so that you have them, and then we're gonna talk about each one. We have the independent, e independent variable which suggests the presence of a dependent variable. And we have a controlled, or I'm going to say it um, standardized variable. I tend to use the word standardized variable um, but when I look around, most places are calling it a controlled variable. So I feel like controlled might be a little more intuitive, but I definitely, if you hear me saying standardized variable, um, that's what I'm referring to. And then the last one I think is also, uh, it's an important one <laughs> and its name is going to tell you what it is. It's a confounding variable. Okay, so we have four types of variables and I've listed them, um, I think in an order that's going to help us remember what they are. At the top of the list is the independent variable. And I'm going to tell you right now, in any experiment, you want one. You want one independent variable. And I'm going to tell you what it is. This is the thing you change in your experiment. So if you're looking at um, survival rates for, what are those little sea monkeys? Brine shrimp in different amounts of um, sodium concentration. Did you follow what I just said? Your question might be, can brine shrimp, what's their favorite concentration of sodium in water for their survival? The thing you're changing in all, in your experiment, the thing that you're looking at is sodium levels. So in one group, you're going to have no sodium. In the next one, you're going to have a little bit. And then you're going to have a little bit more. And then you're going to have a lot of sodium. And you've got this range of um, changes to one variable, sodium concentration. The independent variable, there's only one. I think that's probably the most helpful piece of an independent variable to remember when you're trying to remember these definitions no, the independent one is alone. There's only one of them. The dependent variable 
glory days, you can have as many as you want. And not only can you have as many as you want, that that's because that's what you're measuring. The dependent variable is what you measure. Independent variable, just one, and it's the thing you're changing. Dependent variable, pff, how many measurements do you want to take? How many things do you want to look at? When I change the salt concentration of the environments for these poor little brine shrimp in my experiment, what are going to be the things that I want to know? Um, what, what am I measuring? Well, I got a sad story to tell. You probably should measure the number of brine shrimp that stay alive. So the number that die and the number that stay alive, that would be a good dependent variable. What if you measured um, birth? Like, can they reproduce in that environment? Which environment are they more likely to reproduce in? Um, that might be another dependent variable. What else? Maybe you could measure something about their activity. Like, do they, how much do they move? Maybe there's a way to quantify how much they move, or even um, maybe there's a way to quantify how much food they're taking in or mm, how much carbon dioxide they are producing. There are things that we can measure that will help us understand the impact of that thing that we change. Because the dependent variable is we can have as many of them as we want, you only need one. You, your question might be really simple, that you want to know how it impacts survival. And then you have one thing. You're going to count the dead guys, and that's going to be um, the dependent variable that you have. You're controlled. Again, the name now tells you. Independent variable and dependent variable are easy to get mixed up. Just remember the independent variable is the guy on top. The first one on the list, and there's only one. Controlled variables are all the things that you need to keep the same in your experiment everywhere. So let's just put that down there. The th all things you keep the same. All the things that you're going to hold constant those are your controlled and standardized variables. And you, the best experiments, have the best controls. You're controlling everything. <laughs> you can imagine that um, maybe our brine shrimp experiment, yes, let's do this. We're changing the salt concentration in our water. We're changing the salinity of the water. But what we're going to control is the amount of food each group gets in each different treatment pile. Their food is all the same. They're all gonna get the same amount of food. We're gonna control, let's control the pH of the environment. Let's make sure that the pH of their little homes are the same for all the groups. Let's control that. Let's control the number of critters that we start with. So we're gonna have, and, um, brine shrimp, this might be difficult, but maybe we should try to control um, the some qualities about brine shrimp. I don't think this would be something you'd control in actual brine shrimp, but um, if you're doing experimentation on humans, you definitely want to have, um, there's lots of qualities of a human, age of a human, um, biological, anatomical sex of a human, um, their chromosomes that they might have, any conditions that they might have, how much they exercise, what they ate that morning. These are all qualities that can impact, right? Like they're confound or they're, they're variables that could impact your outcomes if you don't control them. You want to have as many of them controlled as you possibly can. And one of our observations somewhere in this lecture that is growing longer and longer by the minute Somewhere in here, we talked about the fact that it's really hard, impossible to control for everything. 
So you do the best that you can and you can guarantee that the things that you don't control will be criticized in the sign. Like, yes, I didn't control for that thing. And this is why I decided not to control for it. Or this is why it was impossible to control for that thing. So as many things as we can control, we want to. The last one, once a variable is determined that it can't be controlled, it becomes a confounding variable, um, uncontrollable. It's super interesting. Um, doing science on humans, you end up with this giant pile of confounding variables. I've been messing around with um, educational research, like doing, collecting data on my students and then trying to analyze the, the results of the data and draw conclusions about what kinds of teaching strategies are most effective for students. I mean, the number of confounding variables in this is profound. Like, how much experience do students have coming into a course? Have they ever had a biology course before? Do they like watching videos? Do they like um, communicating with their teachers? I mean, there's just a million things that are confounding when you start looking at um, research on humans. But you can see how the more confounding variables you have, the less reliable um, your results are gonna be. That's why it's so good to have a community of humans looking, a community of experts looking at the research, looking at the results, looking at the design and ensuring that as many of those confounding variables are eliminated as possible. Okay, we've done variable land. Oh my goodness, are, are we having fun yet? Please say yes. Next up, we're gonna talk about different kinds of controls.